Well, just like we always do in, in everything that uh, we run here at OPN, we love to just jump right into it. Brian, super glad and excited that you were able to join us today at OPN Ask an Angel. And, uh, you know, the best way for us to kick this off is uh, it's a live, not, well, it was live. Now today we, uh, we just run it and then we get to edit it after and make some great things out of it. But uh, uh, the best way to start is if you can give us a little bit of background on yourself, where you've come from where you're today, uh, the things that you're working on, and then one thing about you that nobody will know. Oh, uh, Jesus. Uh, well, okay, I'll give you the sort of the business background. Um, uh, Ivy MBA, uh, coming out of business school, I uh, joined Roynat Capital in uh, downtown Toronto, first Canadian place, and jumped right in feet first into lending to small and medium-sized companies. Um, have lent to virtually every industry. Uh, they're typically term loans, uh, financing, real estate, equipment purchases, acquisitions, debt, leasing, a little bit of equity. Um, it was there that I met my current business partner. I helped him uh, buy several businesses and uh, kept him out of bankruptcy. So we had a really great trust relationship there. And his business prospered, uh, did really well. Uh, so I, I retired from uh, Roynat about uh, 12 years ago, and the two of us said, let's, let's do something together. So we decided to start a private equity fund, uh, North Spring Capital Partners. So we have two other partners, so there's four of us. Uh, we invest our own capital, and um, we started out just doing uh, traditional industry because he had a manufacturing background in distribution. And they were comfortable with that. And the rule was, hey, no startups. You know, they're too risky. You know, they're, they're so prone to failure. We don't want any, any of that. So we, we, we did a lot of acquisition financing and uh, that went well. But living in um, Kitchener, I certainly saw the angel investment community starting to take off and the tech boom was happening. Um, you had the rise of the accelerators like Communitech and you had government funding coming in for the angel uh, or for the early stage companies. And I just said, guys, we're sitting on a gold mine here. We got to get into uh, investing in, in some startups. And uh, they reluctantly agreed. And uh, that was about seven years ago. Um, and we, we started to uh, invest in early stage tech companies. Um, it's, it's gone quite well. So uh, uh, something you guys don't know about me, I was, uh, we're, we joined in, uh, Golden Tri Triangle Angel Network in Kitchener, uh, Waterloo, and uh, I was named Angel of the Year for uh, 2018. So uh, um, really proud of that. I'm also a member of the uh, Kitchener uh, Conestoga Rotary Club. I've been the past president there and chaired a number of uh, big fundraising projects that they have. Like uh, we used to have a dream home that would raise uh, up to a half million dollars a year and. Uh, uh, a lobster fest uh, and uh, a turkey drive where we raise money for um, uh, people to get a, a, a turkey in a, a food hamper for Christmas. That raises uh, almost $400,000 a year. So that's been fun to do on the side. And then uh, my other side is my sports background. I'm a, a triathlete. Um, my uh, top race would be uh, number 13 in the world at the Madeira World Championships. Uh, uh, about 15 years ago. Amazing. Yeah. It's huge. Well, I was going to ask you about the, the biking and the triathlete side because I'm like, come on, there's something. We've got, we got to dig into this one thing nobody will know. <laughs> so uh, that's great. So appreciate the sharing of that. And, and it sounds like uh, you were made to invest. Just the, the background that you have, the M&A work and all the things that you've done, the debt financing side, you really understand that space. So it's really helped yeah. kind of uh, – perk the curiosity, but uh, also allowed you to, to really dive into that early stage startup world. Um, in that debt side of things, uh, once you, you said that when you started to work in the space and you know they didn't want to go into early stage, at the time, what was kind of the reason that people were afraid of it at that time? And I, and I think even in my end, I was looking at it and helping startups back 20 years ago, and it was, it was so, so uh, pushed away. People didn't want anything to do with it. Um, and it was high fail, high everything, but I think it just was so unsupported that it, it kind of brought that um, negative connotation to yeah. it. 
But what was the reason you guys looked at it then and said, this isn't going to work? And then what was the change to it? What got you guys after you said you found the gold mine? But what was the real change that started to do it? Was it government funding that said, hey, if they're going to come in, there's got to be something here? Like, what was that change that created that? Well, I think it was the, the angel network that I could sit in a room with a dozen other angel investors and look at a deal. And, and some of the guys, some of the angels were ex uh, BlackBerry people. So we're looking at a software company and, and they know uh, the questions to ask and they, they just know the industry really well. And I can piggyback off of their um, experience and, and knowledge. Uh, so that, that was very comforting. And then uh, we would be investing uh, alongside some uh, groups like from Mars, uh, who have a, an excellent track record. And so uh, that gives you a lot of comfort. And then they've gone through an accelerator program. So they've received some coaching. They've uh, got some government funding. Maybe they want, want to pitch competition, made you know, 50 grand or things like that. So that you weren't investing at that really early startup. They had, they had matured a little, little bit. Some of them have some revenue. They've got the product that's already been um, pretty much developed. Uh, you can talk to a customer, you can, it, and, and some of the ideas we're seeing just make so much sense that uh, we said, uh, let, let's, let's try it. And we started small and uh, just sort of grown into it. And now, now we've pretty much stopped doing traditional industry deals and really just focusing on um, startups. That's awesome. And can you share a little bit about what, what you've kind of learned in that seven years, because uh, before that you, you were doing different types of lending. So you could kind of see where these companies were coming from. And that could yep. have been a company that was five, 10 years old that yep. now are coming to you for lending yep. and at a mid tier size. But what have you seen that's really changed a lot in the industry of, of early stage companies? Well, um, certainly it's just the, the number of deals that are out there. Uh, if you're trying to do traditional finance deals, I'm relying on a referral network guys from uh, Roy and I Capital will call me up and say, I've got a deal, they need uh, some equity to go along with it, we'd help them out. But there isn't many deals out there to, to choose from. But if I look at the startup world, well, I, I've got a choice of a uh, thousand or two thousand deals in the Toronto Waterloo Tech Corridor. They all need money. It's a matter of saying which one if suits our criteria and uh, which one we like. Do we like the management? And uh, and uh, so you've got a great pool of selections. So if you've got a good deal flow, uh, you're going to be able to make good choices. And being a member of uh, Golden Triangle Angel Network, we were seeing pitches of uh, three half hour pitches uh, of three companies uh, a month for 10 months of the year. That's 30 deals right there. And then there were other deals that we'd see through them. So you, you got a really good deal flow from just that, uh, that source alone. So. And, and I wholeheartedly agree with that, that the deal flow really does pick up on, on the uh, investor side. And it's, it's interesting that you said there's one thing that they all need, which is financing and money, and yep. which is quite common in startups. And I think that might be one of the things that's really changed a lot in the industry is that um, a lot of these companies, when they first started, it wasn't that easy to find investment. It wasn't easy to get. Yep. Um, there wasn't a big network of angel investors. So you really were going to friends and family and that one uncle that just seemed to always have the money yep. and asking him for it. But, yep. um, but now that's changed and there's, there's money everywhere. So it, it's probably a lot more competitive, um, but what are you finding that in this deal flow, uh, are you seeing things that are uh, affordable? They're in a good spot to jump into. Uh, like what's the, what's the look coming from the outside into these people that are all looking for money? Yeah. Um, yeah, there are deals that are very affordable, uh, but uh, more often than not, they're, they're priced uh, very high. The, the valuations can be uh, uh, very excessive. There's ways to get around that, but um, that, that is somewhat an issue. But uh, uh, I lost my train of thought here. Yeah. And, and what do you find that when you're when you have this type of company that you're looking at investing in and you're looking at different vehicles, are you specifically focusing on equity or are you looking at the same thing, M&A, debt, trying to find ways for acquisitions? Like, do you still go to that side of the brain and say, you know what, I want to help these companies. This is how I'm going to look at it. Or have you guys really refined it down and you're like, no, we're only doing money in equity and we're going to take our money out and 
hopefully 10 years. And that's how we're going to uh, look at this. We've, uh, we're a little unique as a fund in that we'll do both debt and equity. So I've, I've done um, shred financing for tech companies, for example. Uh, so we'll do some secured debt, some unsecured debt, and then uh, convertible notes and, and pref shares, common shares. Um, our strategy always was that we wanted to have some debt in the portfolio because we could charge an interest rate that gave us an income that covers all our, our uh, operating expenses uh, as opposed to uh, other, other funds. They, they, they just do equity. At, there's huge operating expenses that they, they run at a loss for five years until they get that exit. Um, so we, the, we don't like that. So we don't like that strategy. No, and that makes sense. So on the on this side that you're working through the the debt um, scenario, uh, do you structure it so that there are shares that you build into it? So you'll reduce your interest rate. You go in at X percent on a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar loan, but you're getting warrants that you can buy into at X amount. So that at the outcome, you know, year one, they're paying their bills, everything's great. They're using the equity, they're growing. You execute on warrants. And you're basically converting those dollars that you're using to run the business, which again is operational dollars. You're saying, you know what, let's invest. This company's doing yeah. well. We've done um, straight debt that are straight interest rate deals, anywhere from 12 to 20 percent. Um, uh, and then we've done lower interest rate deals where we got some warrants or some kind of sweetener um, tied to the future value of the company. And then we've done no interest rate deals where it's the return is all, you know, warrants or, or, uh, you know, getting right into equity. So we've been pretty flexible depending on the situation. So and we've also done uh, some debt for some of our equity clients. Uh, we did a Perry pursue loan with BDC uh, a couple of years ago to one of our investments, Nicoya Life Science, and they needed capital to, they were growing nicely, but they wanted to add on a layer of debt uh, that was non-dilutive. So we, we struck a nice deal. Um, uh, they paid us back when they raised a large Series A. Okay, so they can do that as well. So you, you yeah. do have clauses where they can be in and out, uh, yeah. not like a, a standard loan where it's four years and you got to pay it in four years. You can't um, make it happen faster or anything like that. So you, you don't have any quick outs or anything to that effect. Yeah. Very interesting. And what are you finding the types of companies that are interested in this debt structure? Is it heavily focused in on companies that are uh, in a growth stage, like looking for high growth? Is it pre-seed companies that are like, you know what, I don't know, I'm not 100% sure, I'm not getting any money from angels, I just want to jump in and, and get some money in the books to start running the business? Yeah. Where are you finding your uh, sweet spot is? Well, a tip, you know, companies would love to get debt because it, it's less dilutive, but uh, debt is not appropriate to all companies. You really should have an in, be at the stage where you're generating some income to pay, to pay the interest cost and, and pay the debt back. Um, so we're, we're selective as to who we choose. You know, if, if it's funding a shred claim, we know we can get paid back when the, when the, uh, the claim is paid by uh, the federal government. So, there's got to be a source of repayment. And what are you finding uh, with the, the timelines that you're getting in there? So let's just say you're focused more on seed and series A, series yeah. A probably because they're going to be raising funds quite frequently, uh, or at least they're on their way up to a series A. Yeah. Um, and are these companies more product based? So you're, are you doing deep tech? Um, like how do you, how do you decide what company is going to fit? Because products are obviously easy to manage debt from. Uh, but can you do the same thing off of a, um, a platform build uh, that doesn't have assets? It's maybe e-commerce based or SaaS model uh, where they're just doing throughput or resourcing or something to that effect. Are you able to still work the same debt structures for? Your uh, yeah, I guess you could on a SaaS play. You've got a source of income coming in. Um, we, we haven't done that much in that area. We've sort of focused more on uh, products. So MedTech is a, is a sweet spot for us. Um, we, we like to see the, you know, the product, uh, investing at the stage when the product is, is nearly developed or, uh, you know, close to getting, uh, approvals to, to sell. Uh, we, we prefer not to get in at that very early stage just because it takes, takes too long. And, uh, when you look at the age of the partners in the fund, like 
do we want our payday when we're 80 years old? I, you know, I, I don't think so. So we're, we're kind of shortening it up. So we're, we're avoiding maybe some of the uh, pre-seed uh, rounds and going late seed and um, some series A. Uh, we don't write checks to be in the series B or series C or series D stage. Um, so, and we prefer to get in at a point where we can maximize our leverage and, and, and get, get that top, top tier return. And what are you finding for, uh, you, you mentioned med tech, what are you finding as being kind of the up and coming spaces that you're getting a lot of attention for debt financing? Uh, well, this was, would be just, uh, could be convertible notes. Yeah. Uh, or, but, or equity, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's patient capital that uh, uh, we're, we're in there uh, generally on a seed stage basis. So um, we're seeing lots of exciting companies that have uh, going after huge uh, markets. Uh, they've got great technology coming out of the universities. Um, and uh, we're, we, we don't like to be the only investor in a deal. So uh, we're finding that there are other investors that we like to co-invest along with um, and they're there. So we can, uh, some of the raises are, uh, are large. Um, so it almost makes sense that if um, like in our case, from a fund perspective, if we're lining up to do an equity investment or leading around, it almost makes sense that you want to have somebody in there working uh, like yourself working on the equity side, sorry, on the, the debt financing side, almost in every deal, because really at the end of the day, you're going to, um, you're going to work through your system and helping them structure operation dollars or growth money in product inventory, things like that. Um, while the equity is going to support the team, the growth, the sales, and uh, there's a really good fine mix there between the two. Yep. There are, yeah, there isn't a lot of data law around in deals. Uh, you know, often it's just a bridge till uh, uh, the, the next fund round. You know, they've got to hit a, get them to hit a couple of milestones so we can attract that larger uh, VC. And when you're talking with uh, the startup, what kind of things are you looking for from them to kind of align them up into your model? Like, is there are you like a BDC and you're you need everything and everything that they would, or is it more based off? Uh, you like this vertical, you, you've got a hunch, they got a good idea, so you're willing to work a little bit differently with them. Uh, how does that work with the startup, especially for the audience, which are mostly made up of startups and uh, investors looking to have these discussions? So yeah. what kind of startup would be, what would they be approaching you with and what's the best way to make a deal? Well, they're, they've got, um, you know, they've got an information package. Uh, hopefully they've got a, you know, a, a Dropbox or some some database online that we can get into the information that it's, it's handy up to date, love to getting a business plan, but uh, you know, first, first blush is a teaser. And usually we're, we're listening to a pitch at a, an angel investment uh, meeting uh, or um, some pitch competition. Uh, we get interested in companies and, you know, want to go talk to them when we see what they're doing. Uh, so They've got to attract our interest when we think the management team looks looks really solid and they've got a, a great idea and they're uh, it's a big market. Um, I, I was reading um, Medtronic today, you know, about Medtronic's vision because they buy a lot of companies and uh, their their um, their vision is to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. And I kind of like those three criteria for the, the deals we look at, uh, certainly in med tech, uh, as opposed to a SaaS deal that helps some company get more eyeballs to their uh, website and, you know, just don't, just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't stir me to action. But so some you, of the deals we've done in, in the med tech space, they are saving lives or really enhancing uh, their, their lifespan. Um, so you are looking for some sort of um, what's the term for the funds that are coming out now that are uh, um, more beneficial to the world and helping support it, growth and health. Yeah. Social, um, social impact funds. Yeah. So is that we're not, we're not a social impact fund, but it's, if you can, if you can invest in, uh, into a, a social cause, why, why wouldn't you do it? 
Agreed. Uh, you know, no, that's you have to have some objectives and uh, your thesis has to support it. Yeah. So that way, you know, you're at least staying on the right path. And it sounds like uh, a lot of a lot of funds and a lot of groups are going towards this because it is in the forefront of on the media side and, and helping with health tech and, yep. and environmental tech and all of these other areas. Yep. Right. So being able to take a piece yep. of those or some of those yep. into your method is going to help. Right. Yeah. Is there a specific thing that you look for um, when you're working with startups, founders, coach, uh, like the team or the things that you look for in a criteria around, around these uh, groups and people? Um, obviously a preference for, um, uh, existing management that have done it before this isn't their first uh, first startup uh, now we have we break our rule own rules all the time but uh, you know that that's a preference um, we had one recently where we we did the deal just because this guy was had a tremendous background and had done a couple successful startups weren't that excited about his idea but let's said let's invest with him and and uh, the idea went nowhere he was failing, but he's pivoted and uh, to the point where we think there's going to be a sale of the business that we're going to get our money back plus a little return. And it just shows you the, the benefit of, of going with uh, really strong management. That's a good point. A lot of, um, a lot of the, the podcast interviews that I've done a, a bunch of times, it's been brought up or, or at least mentioned that I would, that people would rather invest in a, an A team with a B product, then yeah. invest in a A product with a B team. Yeah, yeah. And it, it does carry a lot of weight and value because like you said, there's always the opportunity of um, realizing that things aren't working and then you've got to pivot and make the right changes. And if you're not really in tune with yeah. your team, your business and, and understanding of what you're doing, it's going to be a tough time for you to rotate or shift that boat. Yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. So. Uh, going back to your background now on this M&A side, one, I love m and I just think that yep. being able to spend time ripping through companies and understanding kind of how to pull these boat, uh, all these different boats together and, and build one big ship um, is pretty fascinating. Uh, when you're doing your debt side, are you still kind of looking at that of uh, how can I tie these three companies together and uh, is there a way of doing it in, in the world that you're in or do you just tend to kind of push that away now because it's not really something um, you're doing every day? Well, one of the things I do every morning is I read the press releases that, that come out, just scan them. And uh, usually every day there's some, some press release that some company issued that relates to a client that I've got an investment in. And uh, so I'm keeping track of who they're, you know, they could be competitors uh, or they could be uh, acquirers of my clients. So I'm watching that to see whether there's an opportunity. It could be an M&A opportunity. And um, you can learn a lot from that. And I pass that information on to uh, our clients all, all the time. You know, did, did you see this? Are you following this company? Because you should, um, because you're in the same industry and hey, they're public and you're not. Do, sh should you be emerging in with them? Should they be acquiring you? At least look at their, their products and, 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 uh, and you see how they're valued. And because uh, how do you value these private companies you know, to have a public example? that, you know, hey, they're, they're trading at five times revenue, so that's a fair valuation for you or a, a point of. And you find this educational stuff helps the entrepreneur kind of better position themselves and where they want to go? Because I think yeah, sometimes I think there's, a la 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 uh, there's a lack of understanding of where am I really going and is this really trying to help hone that in for them? Yeah. Well, you too, too many of them, it, it's heads down, focused. they're focused on the product and, and they're not looking at the, the global situation. So maybe that's where I can, can add some value saying, hey, look at, look at these other companies in your industry. This is where the industry is going. Could you not go there as well? Could you not extend your products into that market? Because that's where it's headed. And, and do you find with that side of things, like the entrepreneur with their head down and trying to build their company and as their business starts to grow, are you finding that the founder becomes more comfortable with the position, the growth, the money coming in, that they tend to forget that their goal was to sell in five years or seven years? Um, and that's something that needs to be kind of brought, brought back into the environment again, uh, because sometimes you see a, a good amount of returns happening 
they get too comfortable and maybe they don't look at that as a, an exit anymore. They look at this as, hey, I've been doing this for five years. This is kind of my baby now and I don't know if I can really part with it. Do you find a lot of yeah. that at first? Well, we don't have, we've only been doing these deals for six or seven years. So we don't have a lot of data to say, you know, this is where everybody goes. Um, and it's really an unfair question to a startup. You know, what's your exit strategy? Uh, you know, oh, I think I'll IPO, you know, like when you're, you're, you haven't got revenue yet. Uh, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a, you know, just speculation. Um, but on the other hand, there are some companies that, you know, I, I'm really building this to sell. I know who the big guys, you know, in, in the med tech space, you know, I'm going to sell the med, Medtronic, Stryker, Johnson & Johnson, Zimber Biomet, you know, they know who the buyer could be. Those guys pay a uh, top dollar. They'll pay it 10 or 15 times revenue. So why wouldn't you want to build a company to sell to them? You can do very, very nicely. And we, uh, on the other hand, we have, we do have some companies that do not want to sell. They want to, they want to build it in Canada and keep it here and they want to run it and make it, make it into something great. And maybe I'm, I'm fine with that too. Yeah. Everything's a, an opportunity. It's just how you work with them. But um, I would think um, again on that with the m and background that it's kind of that coaching and trying to get them to, realize the potential too. And sometimes uh, you get too stuck in the weeds of building something that you forget what that outcome was. Yeah. And as VCs, uh, angels, everybody has their own directives. So how do you keep that startup focused, but also looking at the bigger picture, like they can be in 20 years, be the conglomerate in this space and be the owner of the space, yeah. but what do they got to do to get there? And, you know, sometimes it's coaching them on acquisitions. It's coaching them on, uh, better positioning yourself and maybe you're not getting acquired, but maybe you're getting investment from one of your uh, larger uh, competitors or owners in the space because they know that you're growing. So they want to be part of that growth opportunity too, so that one day they could take you over. So there's so many different ways to look at it. Yeah. Um, and I, what I like about what you guys do is that you got to think about all of these different things because a startup isn't going to, and somebody yeah. needs to be there to help yeah. them. Yeah, the problem for us is we're minority investors. Uh, Rarely are, are we on the board. We might have uh, visiting rights to observer rights to to the board meeting. Perhaps we like to get the material and read it, but I don't have a lot of leverage with the, with the CEO once I've given him my money. Uh, I'm along for the ride. So hopefully we only deal with uh, you know entrepreneurs that like to communicate back to us and are willing to listen to uh, our suggestions and. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a gamble. It's a risk in this. Oh, business. for sure. And, and you bring a lot of wealth of understanding and knowledge in the background in the space yeah. of, uh, of financing. So I can't see um, any startup not wanting to take that information in and those insights because it's going to benefit them in the short and long term. Well, you see a lot of deals where um, they don't want to give you information rights, which I just find baffling. Uh, they want to restrict it to the major investor, the guys who are putting the, the big checks and own five or ten percent of the company. And I think that's a big mistake because if you got small investors, um, we, we reinvest all the time in, in companies when they're doing follow-on investments. So if I don't get any information, I'm not going to follow-on invest. Uh, so they're they're hurting themselves there, and um, sometimes these small investors. Uh, have uh, expertise in the industry, uh, know things that can really benefit the company. So you want to build that rapport uh, between the investor and the angel investor and, and the, uh, uh, the management. No, that makes sense. And how do you define um, a team or a business that really fits your model from a financial standpoint? Are they looking for millions? Are they looking for thousands? Like what kind of area do you focus in on? And is there uh, rules that you have structured? It's payback in two years. It converts if uh, the payback doesn't, it goes into equity. Like, are there things that you guys really look for and your ideal opportunity is X? Yeah. Um, we, we do um, a lot of convertible notes uh, that eliminate some of the valuation uh, debate. Uh, when you're buying equity at a price, you, that, that's, you, you've got to make sure it's the right price. You don't get a second chance. Whereas a convertible note, uh, we're going to we're gonna buy it at a discount to the next round or a cap. And if they do really well, I'm very happy to pay the cap. 
If they do poorly, hey, I'm not paying the cap price, I'm paying um, uh, something less, or I'm not converting at all, it's dead, I'm gonna get my money back at maturity. So uh, that, that's uh, an easy, easier way to raise capital at that uh, seed stage uh, than trying to say my equity is worth you know, two bucks a share, which is uh, 40 times revenue. And you know, that's, that's tough. No, that makes sense. And value amount that you guys usually look for, is there a set amount of revenues that they have to have? It could be pre-revenue or do you? Uh, that's well, we all do, we do certainly do pre-revenue deals um, and we prefer they have some revenues, but uh, sometimes you, you don't get that. Um, deal size, uh, generally we don't see that many deals where they're looking to raise less than a half a million dollars. Um, We've, we've participated in deals where they've raised up to, you know, uh, seven or eight million. Uh, our, our check size is usually between 50,000 and a half a million on a startup type transaction. Um, often it's less and we leave room to do follow on investments. So we, we can be with that check size, we can be a lead investor for on an angel round of, you know, half a million, million dollars. And hopefully we can bring in some other government money like Mars or Sophie or FedDev. And, you know, there's all these programs out there, OCE, um, BDC. And you can get the, that, you know, we're, say we're doing 250. Well, we get some Mars money and now we're at a half a million. And then we, we can find a half a dozen angels that are putting in 25 or 50,000. And, and before you know it, you're up to that million dollars. But it takes a lot of players. It takes a lot of coordination to get there. And if and if their end goal is that they're only trying to raise a million, and you get half of that in non dilutive financing, then it's uh, it's certainly um, a pretty good opportunity that you just created. Yep. I like it. I like it, Brian. I think we're going to have to bring you into some of more of our deals. This uh, <laughs> sounds uh, uh, sounds pretty good. And what are you finding the outcome is for the companies that you're working with? Are they, uh, you know, if they do move on and sell, are they, are they interested to keep doing this route? Do they tend to try and say, you know what, I don't want equity. I don't want to raise money anymore. I've lived through this. I'm just going to build a company myself without getting any money because I found it too difficult the first time. Have you had to go through those experiences? Um, or do you find this just like, I want money and I want to grow? Um, I would say everybody wants the money. <laughs> Very, very few situations do I see where they're really bootstrapping it themselves without capital. They want to grow quickly. They're onto a good opportunity. If they don't seize it, you know, somebody else is going to come up with the idea. Um, it, rarely are you the only one with the idea. Um, and uh, lately I've seen, uh, we've had some deals which are, have been pretty popular and they're, they're oversubscribed. And um, the CEOs are saying, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it because it just defers that next series A round or series B round raise because we can got longer runway and we're, you know, anybody that had capital going into uh, COVID-19, boy, were they happy. And we, we were really fortunate. Three of our biggest investments all had large raises of, you know, five to $10 million back in last January and February. So they rode through the, the pandemic uh, without any ish, capital issues. Oh, well, that's good. Uh, yeah, all of those risk factors come in on any type of investment, right? Yeah. And COVID has been a, a tough one to kind of mitigate, but I think a lot of uh, a lot of people found their way through about mid-year, and I think they've uh, either pivoted or turned the corner. And if they weren't able to, they failed fast, and then just kind of jumped into the next opportunity. And it seems yeah. that uh, I think you mentioned earlier that there is a lot of opportunities out there. Um, and just like back in 2007, eight financial crisis, it started off slow. And then there was a massive boom of, of startups that came out of, out of nowhere. Are you seeing that same thing happening now in the investment world? Yeah. If you asked me last March, you know, things really dried up. Uh, my partners didn't want to do any more deals. The stock market was down 40%. Uh, the, the, uh, the startup valuations had didn't have that drop. You know, people wanted to hang on to last month's valuation, and it was clearly, you no, know, something's got to give. So uh, uh, we 
we did, uh, we, we sort of paused for a couple of months, but we got right back into it investing and, uh, and uh, we, the, the market came back, it just more and more investment opportunities sort of came our way. No, that's good. And I completely agree with you. There was about two weeks where I thought what happened and then yeah. just boom, all of a sudden it went from uh, that two week of slowdown. And I thought, man, I, I've never uh, experienced the least amount of emails in a day in my life. And then all of a sudden it was 10 times that. And I thought, okay, now I guess everybody just decided it was a holiday for two weeks and now it's yeah. back to business. Yeah. So yeah, that's good. Um, well, I, I think we got a, a really good understanding of kind of where you've come from and the journey and the things that you guys focus on and, and really a lot of your background on how you operate and look at companies. Um, I'd love to uh, jump into the rapid fire questions. Uh, but just before I jump in the rapid fire questions, I've got one kind of more um, deep dive kind of question. And it's, uh, we're always looking for that one heartstring pulling kind of story where you're working with a startup and she or he kind of went through some turmoil or they were awesome and then COVID hit and then it just killed them. Um, just kind of looking for that war story that really kind of puts an emphasis on what startups really go through because they think there's a lot of um, ideas out there that everybody's a Elon Musk and a Tesla and they're just going to sell companies for billions every year and it's, uh, it's so easy that you got to be an entrepreneur versus you know, what are the tackles, the things you got to really tackle in this environment to, to really become thick skinned and grow? Mm -hmm. Gee, that's a tough one. Tough question. Uh, I'm trying to think who I can, who I could talk about there. Well, you don't have to give names or uh, business yeah. names or just uh, uh, context to, I guess, what it, what it really shows the takes to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Not coming up with any uh, great stories at the moment. It's this dogged determination. Um, we, we've got companies that in, in the med tech space, it takes so long to get your FDA approval and, and costly that they've got to continuously raise capital. And um, if they, one company we've invested in, uh, it's been like six, seven years and uh, They've stuck with it. They're now got their FDA trials underway. Um, they've got one of the major uh, companies in their industry has uh, made a minority investment in them. And we can see light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to, it's going to be a success. Uh, their product works um, very well. It's the best product on the market, but it's still going to be two or three years from now until it actually gets the market with the, uh, the approval process. Um, so it's a long ride and you got to bring yeah, a very long ride, much longer than we ever expected. Um, much longer. So we have to be patient. No, then that's good. And I think, uh, sometimes again, companies don't see that, right. They think that everything moves pretty quick. So it's good to know that, uh, a lot of companies have to go through the, the long duration, the long push yep. and spend a lot of time raising funds and lots of times during yep. the year, they're not doing it just once every few years that they're always out hustling for, for new dollars to keep that business afloat yep. keep investing and keep the business driving. Yeah. No, I love it. <clears throat> so rapid fire questions. Some of these we've already talked to, but again, it just puts it back, rounds it all back sure. in context. Um, so what's your favorite part of investing? Oh, I enjoy uh, meeting the entrepreneur, hearing his uh, idea figuring out whether that's, you know, something we'd be interested in. That's a blast. Okay. Uh, how many companies do you invest in per year? Probably at the most recent stage, maybe uh, five, six deals. Okay. And any verticals you like to focus on? Definitely. Um, med tech, healthcare. Okay. Uh, do you have any due diligence requirements that you look for before you make a commitment? Um, yeah, the, the normal due diligence that, um, you know, any angel or VC would look at. Uh, obviously, VC would be a lot more detailed, but um, there's uh, your listeners might be interested. There's a, um, a group called Seraph, and uh, 
they they have a really good document that they do uh, on uh, due diligence requirements by angel investors. So if you're a company and you want to look at something, it, it's uh, it's SCRAF dash investor.com you can go online and probably find it it's a good resource okay. done i'm going to look that up thank you that's uh super helpful um okay uh outside of the dd requirements is there uh, another focus you mentioned the team is there other things that you look for that really wrap up this this uh investment for you i'm always concerned about uh, competition um, uh, either new technology coming that's coming that may affect the company or, you know, existing competitors, uh, I, I was worried that, you know, there's somebody over in China that's doing the same thing with far more resources than uh, the little companies we're dealing with here. Uh, you know, you gotta be aware of that. Um, often I, I get around that by, um, you know, the other investors that, uh, we're dealing with. Hopefully you've got somebody that has uh, a little more in-depth knowledge of the industry. Okay. Uh, do you lead, you mentioned it, you lead rounds. Do you have any preferred terms that you like to invest on? Uh, we like convertible notes, just that we're not faced with that pricing decision where there's a little more flexibility there. And uh, we, we can do structure a deal that works well for the company and, and for ourselves. Um, generally more at the seed stage, uh, not, not at the series A stage. Uh, most of those deals, they, they're usually preferred share transactions. Okay. Uh, do you do an, uh, follow-up investments and what percentage of investments do you do follow on? Yeah, we're doing... Um, just uh, did a proposal on one today. We're looking at doing a follow-on for a, a, a deal. Um, all, there are almost as many deals or follow-ons as, as new deals. That's what we're finding. Uh, we've got a mature, more mature portfolio now. We've got uh, uh, 22 or 23 uh, investments. So keeping a, it keeps you busy. I can imagine. I can imagine. Um, is there anything outside of um, money that you guys also provide to the startup to help them? Um, I don't have a technical background, so I'm not going to try to tell them how to build the product or any, you know, things like that. But um, I've got a, a network of contacts. Um, I can help them with uh, who should they be talking to on, uh, you know, raising capital, uh, maybe bring in some other investors that I know from other transactions. So I can help them you know, what's the best way to structure the, the uh, financing that you're looking for, whether it be debt or equity. Um, I can liaise with other investors on their behalf. Uh, that's sort of where I play. Maybe some strategy ideas on uh, what I've seen in one company that, hey, you should be thinking about doing the same thing. I've got two right now that are kind of similar companies and I like, I'd love to put them two together and then go public. I think they would be a, just a dynamite investment. So um, that's, that's the M&A dream. Yep, exactly. I love it. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was it, interesting that you say that, but that was um, the whole reason when I created OPN, it's called the Open People Network, was because it drove me crazy that I would have 10 of the same company pitching the same fixes and builds. And your job is to figure out which one of the 10 is going to be more successful than the other nine. And I always thought, man, does anybody collaborate? Does any, and they, none of them knew their competition. So I thought, yeah. how do we be a bit more open about this? And maybe all 10 companies could solve it together because they're all in the same boat, probably hitting the same revenues. And you got to figure out which one's going to make it forward. So uh, yeah. I like that because as they get going further ahead, you've got yeah. two great companies building two streams and there's a great yeah. way to kind of collaborate them together. Yeah. Sometimes pride gets in the way, but again, at least yes. it's, uh, it's worth opening up the door to see what happens. Yep. No, I love that. Uh, well, Brian, we're going we're gonna to jump right into kind of the, the last little segment, which is a little bit more personal side of things. Um, I, I, would, uh, I would say that today I did something a little bit different. So since I sit here so much now compared to how I used to uh, yeah. run all over the place, dropping and doing what I needed to do. 
uh, I've started to take digital notes versus taking everything on paper because oh. uh, you can see, because I find that um, I need to share them with the team so that they can rip through the show, the notes and things like that to kind of move forward. So I thought, well, taking a picture of my chicken scratch is probably killing people. So uh, maybe if I start doing some real kind of quick typing in the background, I can keep that flow going and just taking the real key uh, metrics of the conversation while they're going and watching the video anyhow to take out the information they need to, to push it out. So yep. it's been uh, an interesting experience. Uh, I'm not sure if you can tell, but I'll be better at it. I'm getting better at it. But being my first uh, typing while chatting, I was trying to be as quiet as possible and getting what I could out. So, But you did a great job. I'll put a, I'll put a plug in for one of our uh, startup investments, uh, a company called Eureka, Y-O-U-R-I-K-A. And okay. they're in the educational uh, software market, and they've come up with video transcription service that um, the lecture can be automatically transcribed and then searched. If so you're doing a science class and you want to know about hydrogen, well, it'll type in hydrogen, and every part of the, the video where hydrogen is mentioned just pops up, and you can quickly um, study what uh, what happened in the class. Awesome. What's the uh, founder's name? Why do I, I know that? Um, I think I know it's the same company. Uh, Rob Henderson. Yeah, I know, I know yeah. Rob. Uh, I work, we, did, we did development work for him through one of my other companies um, when he was part of um, another network. I, okay. Uh, uh, what was an education network? And then um, Rob and them pitched, I think, a G10, uh, uh, maybe a year and a half yes. ago. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. They had a, a different uh, grouping of PhDs that were running on their business. So uh, I was a, I've been a big fan of Rob regardless, but uh, certainly liked the, uh, the company as well. So that's awesome. Yep. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, all right. So the last uh, little piece is three questions. Favorite sports team. Favorite sports team? Uh, <laughs> uh, Buffalo Sabres. The Sabres, nice. I, I, when I was growing up, my dad had season's tickets to the Sabres, so well, we used to go to the games together. That's awesome. Uh, we used to go to the games as well back in the day in Buffalo because uh, we couldn't well, we weren't big fans of watching Toronto play, so uh, we would go there. <laughs> uh, the atmosphere is a lot more fun, so uh, yeah. awesome. Um, all right, your favorite movie, and what character would you play in the movie? Okay. Um, I, I, I do like uh, comedies. I've uh, always a uh, favorite was Planes, Trains, and Automobile with uh, John Candy and yeah. Steve Martin. Yeah. Um, Geez, you know, that's a tough choice. Do I want to be Steve Martin or John Candy? <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I can't answer it. You got to tell me because it yeah, it defines more about you and your background. So I find that it actually works to because you always picture yourself as somebody uh, or the way the character plays. So yeah. I'm just curious as to how that defines. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, John Candy. I like John Candy. Awesome. Awesome. I think they both played brilliant roles. I'm not going to lie. So I watched yeah. the movie literally probably a month ago. And, uh, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm a fan of them as well in that movie. So Yeah. Uh, I can yeah. see myself selling shower rings, you know. <laughs> Earrings. I totally. Those. Yeah. And just the yeah. lines he had, you just felt compelled to buy one anyway. So, like, he just was good. Yeah. Good with people. So yeah. it worked out, right? Yeah. No, I love it. Awesome. Well, uh, Brian, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, we learned a lot. I would show you my notes, but I can't. I was like, can I turn my camera to show them? But regardless, thank you very much yep. for your insight today. Uh, we learned a lot. It's uh, great for the community. Uh, good old handshake yep. there too. Um, and the way we like yep. to end things is we want to give you the last word. So anything that you want to share to uh, the startup community or to the investors out there, uh, we give you the last word and uh, feel free to take the mic and, and say what you think is best. Okay. I'll, I'll just, uh, 
I'm always trying to help our clients with their businesses and uh, promote them. So we've got an investment in a company called workwolf.com and they're building a, uh, a digital vault, which will hold um, a person's credentials, their education, background checks and things like that, employment records. Um, and that can be shared with an employer and uh, it's, it's totally secure. So it eliminates uh, resume fraud for one thing. You can't fake where you got your uh, degree because the, the data got, comes in by the, uh, the educational uh, data provider, not the uh, individual. And they, they have a website, uh, workwolf.com, and they've got a, a, a personality uh, career planning tool on it called Pathfinder. And you can take that and it, it, it will tell you uh, all about yourself and whether you're really suited to be an entrepreneur, whether you're good to work on your own or you're a team player and what your strengths and weaknesses are. Any, anybody looking to be an entrepreneur might be wise to just take that test. And, uh, or maybe there's a couple of you guys or gals that are thinking you'll just join together and, and build a team why not take that test and see if how your characteristics and uh, skill sets are? Do you mesh together, or is there going to be conflict that you're all the same type A player? And it's free; it's totally free. They've got it free. And it's a, it's worth a hundred bucks. It takes about a half an hour to answer a bunch of questions, and you, you get a, a great report back. What's it called? I'm looking on the site right now. Uh, Pack Finder. You're going to have to scroll down near the bottom of. Uh, of the uh, landing page and uh, there's a little box that says pack finder. So you can take that and then if you like that, you can also sign up for their service, which is storing your credentials. Um, that's gonna be big in the future. I'm gonna try this out, try my luck and see after 15 years if uh, I should uh, get out of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, but exactly. I, but I think for the uh, uh, for the community, that's great. And I'm, uh, uh, thank yeah. you very much for sharing that along. So, um, okay. really, but again, Brian, thank you very much for your time today and, and sharing all the insights okay. that you did and, uh, all the best on your uh, ride. If you're going out for one now and, um, you better get uh, another watch in on the candy movie. Cause it's, uh, it is pretty good and it's always a good laugh. So <laughs> always yeah, right on. Okay. Thanks Jeffrey. Okay. That was awesome. Hey, Pretty big uh, uh, work change by doing this all on Excel and while working, but I think it worked a little bit easier. I have my head down less and less writing, uh, but at the end of the day, it worked out pretty good. So uh, he provided some really good insights on how the investing works, what the debt financing looks like. Totally different than all the other interviews we've done. I think there was only Jeff Messina, which was one of the other um, investors that we talked to that did more later stage debt financing. So really cool what these guys are doing. Um, and we work together at uh, the G10 screening committee. So uh, really big fan of, uh, of Brian and what he's doing. So if you guys are uh, interested in that style of investing, it's a great podcast to listen to. So thanks again for checking in guys and um, have a great day.